Welcome to the Triathlon Nutrition Academy podcast. The secret weapon in your ears for triathletes who want to get fitter, faster, stronger, and healthier with evidence-based nutrition. Welcome back to another episode of the TNA podcast. It is good to be back. We've been on a little bit of a break, but I'm back with another episode today that I've just been itching to tell you about. And it is a new paper that was published in December 2023 that, you know, being on a break hasn't been good because all this stuff has happened in the nutrition space that I haven't been able to tell you about. So you may have heard about it. You may not if you're not a bit of a nutrition geek like me, but it potentially changes everything we know about protein intake and the way that we think about the way that we consume protein. It basically blew up the nutrition internet (laughs) over Christmas. (laughs) And again, you may not be aware of that if you're not a nutrition geek, but it was really cool and a really cool study. And I want to talk you through it today and the details about what they did and how they did it, which blows my mind, but also the practical implications of that, because I'm very much a practitioner. I love to dive into the research, but then I take from the research what I would do to change my practice or how I would help athletes. And then I kind of forget the details of the paper. So Previously, our nutrition guidelines around protein were the best way to have protein would be to spread it evenly right throughout the day, you know, distribute it evenly because that is going to maximally stimulate our muscle protein synthesis rates. Now, we knew or thought we knew that there was this threshold that we could maximally do that. And any excess above about 20 grams of protein was going to basically be a waste So we want our muscle protein synthesis rates to increase. That helps our muscles to recover and helps us also to adapt from training. So we want that, right? We don't want to dampen that. We want to maximize that as much as possible, particularly as a triathlete where we are training like two, three, sometimes four times a day, and we are constantly recovering and repairing, and we don't have the luxury of time to sit back and do nothing for a couple of days while our body fully recovers. So we thought that there was this linear increase in muscle protein synthesis up to about 20 grams of protein. And then once we hit that, it kind of plateaued. There's like little slight increases of around 10 to 20% over the four hours. It would slightly go up, but very much a plateau if we like draw a graph. And any excess above that is just increasing our oxidation rates. So when it came to protein, the message was more does not always equal better. In fact, it doesn't. It's just a waste. And what we're seeing in the research, because it's cool, it's trendy, it's like the thing is to do intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating, there's a lot more research in that space, particularly when Ramadan was over the Olympics a few years back now. There's way more research happening in that time-restricted eating and what are the implications of that? And so with that style of eating, there's not that even protein distribution across the day, right? You've got, you know, four, maybe six hours to consume all of your calories, all of your protein, all of your nutrients. And so there wasn't that beautiful protein spread that we thought was really needed to maximize muscle protein synthesis. And so what they found, though, is that there was no detrimental impact to lean body mass. People weren't losing lean tissue as a result of doing that long term. And we are seeing much more longer-term studies in that space. So this new randomized control trial, which is the top tier in terms of research structure and hierarchy, like that is the best quality, is that it's randomized, it's controlled, as in there's a placebo and a control group, as well as the intervention. And ideally, we want it doubly blind too. So this study, let me talk you through it. I'm going to kind of gloss over the really finer details in a way. Go and read that paper if you're that way inclined, but it is very deep. (laughs) Just a warning. I'll link it in the show notes if you do want to dive into it. But what they did was they intrinsically labeled milk protein. Now, I'll talk you through that. I probably actually need the author to explain it in a better way than I can, but I'm going to really dumb it down so it made sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to you. But what they do is... They give cows these traceable isotope amino acid infusions. So they're giving them basically a drip of traceable isotopes. So they're putting amino acids into this drip, giving them to the cows, and they've got like these little labels or these little tags on them that help them see where those amino acids go. 
Like, so cool, right? And so cows that make milk make milk, and that milk that they produce is then labelled with these amino acid isotopes that are traceable to see, you know, where they're going. They use that milk in this study to give the athletes their milk protein so that they could then trace where those amino acids were going in the human body. Like, blows my mind. The amount of money that they probably have to be able to do that, to start at the cow to make the milk protein to give to the participants in the research. Like, they obviously have a gigantic budget, which is pretty cool. Okay, so they tested giving athletes no protein, so zero grams, 25 grams or 100 grams of protein immediately after a whole body resistance exercise session. And then they measured their markers, so blood markers and muscle biopsies for 12 hours afterwards. Side note, can you imagine sitting in a lab or hanging out in a lab for more than 12 hours and being punched in the muscle to get a muscle biopsy (laughs) every few hours? All in the name of research, right? And what they found is that 100 grams of protein dose, the participants that had that after resistance exercise, had a whopping 19% higher muscle protein synthesis over the four hours, which is in line with previous research understanding, you know, around that amount. But over the 12-hour period, 30% higher muscle protein synthesis rates over 12 hours compared to the 25 grams of protein dose. So it's if the 25 gram protein dose runs out of steam, like it has its threshold, but 100 grams just keeps going. And previously we thought that, you know, more just got wasted and was oxidized. But after this research, we now know that that's probably not true. Like, yes, more protein does increase oxidation, but they quantified exactly how much. And the new research dove into that in detail and found that 15% is oxidized but 85% is not, which is huge. I'm interrupting my own episode to let you know that we're on the countdown to open the Triathlon Nutrition Academy doors on July the 6th. So if you're interested, make sure you've got your name on our July waitlist at dietitianapproved.com forward slash academy if you're ready to level up your nutrition with me. Now, as part of Open Week, you're invited to join me at Fuel School. It's a three-day live online nutrition training week designed to give you the nutritional edge and lay the foundation of your day-to-day fueling and race nutrition. It's on between the 10th to the 12th of July at 9.30 a.m. Brisbane time or Australian Eastern Standard Time each day. Now that's 4.30 p.m. Pacific time, 6.30 p.m. Central time and 7.30 p.m. Eastern time a day before, so the 9th to the 11th of January. Whether you're a seasoned triathlete or just starting your journey, This event is your opportunity to learn from me, an advanced sports dietitian and triathlon nutrition specialist, to help transform your approach to nutrition. Register, it's seven bucks at fuel.school. I'll see you there. So for many years, for as long as I've been a sports dietitian, the message has been regular hits of 20 to 30 grams of protein. And now we're seeing this new research come out that's saying, hang on a minute, like more could be better. 100 grams is ginormous, uh, but that is going to really stimulate muscle protein synthesis even more. But, you know, from a practical perspective, you might read that and go, cool, I'm going to go have 100 grams of protein all the time now. 100 grams of protein is a lot. It's not a 100 gram piece of meat. To get 100 grams of protein from, say, steak is a 320 gram steak. It's ginormous, or 350 grams chicken breast, also ginormous. I mean, some people can eat that, no worries, but I would presume that triathletes would struggle a little bit with that volume. It's four scoops of WPI, protein powder. You know, most people have one. If you're a vegan, vegetarian athlete and you use something like firm tofu, it is 850 grams of firm tofu. So that's like two packets, like ginormous. It's 1.2 kilos of Chobani yogurt, you know, the high protein Chobani, (laughs) which is one and a half of those big tubs in a sitting. And if you want to do it with eggs, to get 100 grams of protein, you need to eat 16 eggs. 
Okay, you with me? Like ginormous portion sizes. It's not something that we would do or sit down to do on a regular basis. I would suggest that you'd be probably pretty damn full. (laughs) And I'm also not suggesting you do that because you're a human and you're not a snake. You have the ability to eat regularly, generally. Uh, You don't have to eat one ginormous thing and then that's it for a few days while you digest it and you can't move. So in terms of practice... I used to sit down and help athletes meal plan to maximize those muscle protein synthesis rates and ensure we had at least three, sometimes up to six meals a day. There were at least a 20 gram of protein hit. So this paper has definitely changed the way I think about protein and my practice, which I think is ginormous. Like this doesn't happen very often these days. And so on the back of my mind, that new research means to me I probably don't need to be so, you know, diligent and stress so much about the minutiae detail of that even distribution. I think as long as your overall protein intake hits your numbers for you, everyone's different, your protein requirements are different. You can't just follow what your partner does or your training buddy does. You need to know what your specific protein needs are. But as long as that's sufficient and you are eating like regularly, you don't have to dial that in with protein so that they're very evenly, okay? And I don't think that we are ready to throw out that protein distribution altogether yet. I'm not suggesting you just eat all your protein at once, like eat it right at dinner. That is what how a lot of people eat. They don't eat enough protein breakfast, definitely, recovery, definitely, lunch often, and then have a heap at dinner. I still don't think that that's the right way to eat, but I think the detail of all of that can be relaxed a little bit, which is pretty cool. Now, I don't think it's difficult to still eat protein in a distributed type of way. And I would still think that you would do that, particularly if you are training a couple of days, because make sure you are ticking off your recovery boxes after your sessions, right? And that is a certain amount of protein, depending on who you are and what your needs are. So we're still going to have some distribution with protein if you're training in the morning and you're training in the evening and you're doing your recovery at both ends. If you have no idea what your protein and recovery targets are, that's something that I teach athletes in my Triathlon Nutrition Kickstart course. You can go and do that at any time at dietitianapproved.com forward slash kickstart and I will show you the fundamentals of understanding what your recovery nutrition targets are. Among other things, we talk about fueling, we talk about pre-training, we talk about supplements, we talk about a few things to get you kickstarted on your nutrition journey as a triathlete. And then if you wanted to dive into that in way more detail, then that's something we talk about right throughout the Triathlon Nutrition Academy program. Doors are opening soon if you do want to come and join us. Make sure you have your name on our wait list though, dietitianapproved.com forward slash academy. So there you go. A new paper doesn't happen very often that completely blows up the nutrition landscape. What do you think about it? Have you read it? Have you heard of it? Are you going to eat like a snake now (laughs) or do you like to evenly spread your protein? Come and let me know in the Dietitian Approved Crew Facebook group. Head to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Dietitian Approved Crew. Is this research going to change the way that you eat and your diet in any way? Come and let me know. All right, in a new segment, I'm going to wrap up our podcast episodes with a listener question. This one comes from Rob Stent all the way across the ditch in New Zealand. And he asked, as a 67-year-old male triathlete, what are the key nutritional strategies or necessities that as an older athlete I need to build not only into my training and racing plans, but also just for long-term good health for the future so that you can continue in the sport? Great question, Rob. We probably need to do an entire podcast episode on the Masters athlete. Quick little disclaimer before we get into it, though. This is generalized advice. This is not individualized. I can't give you specifics because I don't know all the things about you. And so this needs to be taken as generalized advice, not individualized until I know your medical history, your medications, your training volume, your diet, all those types of things. But some big hitters that you need to focus on and understand and be across as a master's athlete. The first thing that comes to mind is protein. Always protein. We get protein resistance as we get older. And we have this uphill battle where we are trying to not lose muscle mass as we age. So recovery nutrition becomes really important, but also making sure you are meeting your protein requirements 
on the daily basis. Now, how you get that may not matter so much now. (laughs) Still wouldn't suggest eating it all in one go. It's going to be hard. And making sure you do do a really good job of your recovery. Your recovery targets do shift as you get older as well. So when you were younger, whatever you did before is unlikely to continue working as we mature as a triathlete. The other thing to think about might be your overall energy intake, which again does kind of shift as we get older. Again, it depends on what your training volume is, what your medical history is, all those types of things. But we have this slight decrease in our resting metabolic rate as we get older because our lean muscle tissue does go down. Not in everyone, but we are pushing shit uphill to try and maintain our muscle tissue as we get older. You need to be doing resistance training. You need to be maximizing your protein intake. You need to be getting enough energy, all those things to maintain it. But just be mindful that you may have some shifts in your overall energy budget. And so you need to focus on getting what you need, but really nutrient-rich foods for the energy budget that you have. You may find that you don't need as many calories as when you were younger, depending on what your training volume is. But for those calories that you do have in a day, making sure you are ticking all of your nutrient boxes. So on that, a couple of key important nutrients, particularly as we get older, but particularly for endurance athletes would be calcium and vitamin D. Because as we get older, we increase our risk of osteoporosis or porous bones. And as you approach 70 as a male, your requirements for calcium do kick up another level. So just be mindful of that in the next couple of years. Not quite there yet, but your calcium needs do go up from 70-ish. The other thing to go hand in hand with calcium is vitamin D. We need that as a key nutrient for our bone growth and mineralization, our immune response, muscle function, loads of different functions in the body. But as we get older, we have up to a 50% decrease in our skin's capacity to convert vitamin D in that whole production cycle. So understanding what your vitamin D status is, but also can you maintain that through the winter in New Zealand? Or is there things that you need to be doing in the summer to maximize your storage? Something to check with your doctor rather than doing anything random. Like again, this is very generalized advice. I don't know anything about you just yet, but go and get that checked to make sure your vitamin D status is optimal because we do need that for strong bones. So you need to make sure you're getting enough calcium and making sure you've got vitamin D status optimized as well as protein, like big key nutrients as we get older. There are some potential supplements that I would consider with you, Rob, but again, I don't know anything about you to give you specifics. But there are some things as we get older that we can harness the power of to make the whole process of getting older, (laughs) becoming more mature, a little bit easier as well. So if you do need help dialing all of those things in, as you're getting older or for anyone listening that's getting older, then come and join us in the Triathlon Nutrition Academy because doors open soon and that is the type of detail that we dive into. When I know about you and I have your medical history, I know what you're up to training-wise I know your goals. We can check bloods and all those sorts of things. Dietitianapproved.com forward slash academy. Make sure you have your name on our wait list if you are interested in joining us. All right, legend. Thank you for listening. Thanks for wrapping me around your ear holes today. And thank you for sticking around to the end. I will talk to you soon. 